Proverbs chapter 1, here's something to think about that I'm saying now to challenge you, and I think that we need to be challenged because we have to serve God acceptably and God expects a return on his investment. Now, we in Proverbs 1 are reading about the fear of the Lord in verse 7 is the beginning of knowledge. Fools do not value wisdom and and instruction. The thing that is a challenge in this verse is that if you ask people what is the beginning of knowledge, you know, where do you begin to learn something? Where do you begin to understand something? It's not likely that they will respond with Psalm, or I'm sorry, with Proverbs 1 7, the fear of the Lord. But that's the truth. Right? We very often are thinking that knowledge begins with maybe A, B, C, and one, two, three. And uh, those are useful tools and I recommend them to everybody, that's fine. But that's not the kind of knowledge that we mean. And that's not the kind of knowledge that you need if you are trying to go to heaven. What you need is to know what God wants and to please him. And this knowledge comes first um, by means of the fear of the Lord. So I think that what's really important about that is to to get in the mind that um, serving God is not an intellectual endeavor. It's not just something where you reason your way uh, into this or you're you're backed into a logical corner where you have no other choice uh, because of the the uh, compulsion of the argument that's been presented to you or whatever else it might be. It's not like that. Um, those kinds of things are not really what is part was not, that's not really how you acquire this knowledge, the Bible. You acquire this first by means of the fear of the Lord. And another way of saying that would be that if you're reading this book, and it's not because you have a basic fear of the Lord, then you're not gaining knowledge from it. You might be gaining facts from it, but it's not a fact book, right? People gain history uh, from the scriptures and the scriptures are a valid testimony to history as any, you know, they're as valid as any ancient source. They're as well attested uh, as any documents from antiquity, but it's not a history book. And people garner philosophy from Ecclesiastes, but it's not a philosophy book either. Right? It's the book of God. It's the word of God. It's intended for us to understand what God wants and to please him and to know the good news that he wants us to be saved. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is the thing that people don't get. If you are unconcerned about God, there's not much we can do. If you're not concerned about what God thinks or, or whether God cares about this or that or the other that I might be doing or trying, I don't know how I'm supposed to help you. Uh, you know, if somebody doesn't care what God thinks, why do they care You know what I say? I barely care what I say. Um, but Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It says fools despise wisdom and destruction, and we are, wisdom and instruction, rather. We often think of despise as a, a strong word for hate, but it's not. Uh, despise means uh, devalue, de-emphasize, uh, deprioritize, think little of, give no importance or value to, undervalue, really. So it doesn't mean that they hate it, although sometimes the fool does hate wisdom and the fool does hate instruction sometimes. It doesn't mean that so much. It says he's deprioritizing de it. it. It's basically nothing. It's not important. Wisdom and instruction are just not important to the fool. 
who may have this world's riches and he may have this world's learning, but he's still a fool if he's not right towards God. And you're not right towards God unless you have a fear of the Lord. It cannot be because the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. It starts there. Yeah, there's lots of things we can learn about the Bible. And I've noticed, maybe you've noticed too, a trend that in order to be known in the world as a Bible scholar, the one thing that you cannot know is what the Bible actually says. They have no idea what the Bible actually says. That's what you find all the time. Archaeologists digging in uh, you know, the ancient Near East, they, they're digging up these houses and they're saying, you know, I don't know if Israel actually existed. Well, why do you say that? Well, because these houses that I'm digging up, these are Canaanite houses. And there's, you know, these cities are Canaanite cities and their layout and, and I'm thinking, and so therefore you think that Israel doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, this, this book is, is a myth. I'm like, okay, did you read the part of that book that said that you will inherit cities you did not build? Cisterns you did not dig? Vineyards you did not plant? Did you read that part? Well, uh, you know, I've heard, it. yeah, right. See, you don't get it at all. <laughs> I could have told you before you put a shovel in the ground, you weren't going to find Israelite houses. They don't exist. The Bible told you this already, but why would you, you know, if you could just do what the Bible says, you wouldn't have to go to school for it. <laughs> they're in business to make a profit, these so-called scholars, but they're not profiting anybody because it's not beginning with a fear of the Lord. They're not trying to do what God wants them to do. They're trying to learn about the Bible, which they find fascinating but not compelling, not something you have to do. Not a thing over which we would actually draw lines, which is unfortunate because that is exactly what you're supposed to do. In John 7 now, we're ready. We go back to John 7 at verse, uh, no, that's not correct. At verse 17 it is. I might even go back just a bit more. Say about the 14th verse. There is, uh, you know, the great feast is happening at this time. The, all the Jews are going up to Jerusalem for this. Jesus' family has a long-standing practice of going up to the feast every year. This we learned in Luke and other places. And here we are in John 7, 14, the, about, the, about the middle of the feast. Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Judeans, the Jews, marveled, saying, how is it this man has learning when he has never studied? And this is the way the world works. The world is thinking, how could this Judean, th or he's not really Judean, right? He's from Galilee. He, he's, I mean, Galilee is Bubba, Bubbaville, you know. That's a very blue-collar, not educated kind of town with a thick accent that betrays them uh, at, as is recorded in the gospels when Jesus is uh, being given his mock trial. They recognize that the apostles had the same accent. Um, they're thinking, well, you know, uh, if he's from, you know, how can he know anything and be from where he's from, whatever that might be in your particular worldview? How can he learn? How can he have knowledge? But Jesus said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. What he's saying is, it's in some sense, it's not his knowledge. He's only relaying what God said. There is great knowledge in what God said. And if you accurately portray the word of God, then you seem to be very knowledgeable. But in fact, it's God's word that's knowledgeable. The Bible knows people. The word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, discerning the hearts and the minds. But this Jesus said, my teaching isn't mine, it's his who sent me. And the 17th verse is the key here. 
that relates it back to Pro, uh, uh, yeah, the Proverbs 1, 7. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. This is the same as Proverbs 1, 7. It said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's accurate. You don't have knowledge. You don't have wisdom if it didn't start with fear. Because fear of the Lord is translated here in John 7, 17. If anyone's will is to do God's will. That's the fear of the Lord. It means you care what he wants. That's his will. What does he want? If you care what he wants, it means you want to do what he wants. Why would you want to know what he wants? Unless you were going to do it. Right? People don't listen when they don't want to do something. <laughs> if you're trying to do what the boss wants you to do, then you go ask the boss what he wants you to do or she wants you to do, right? But if you're trying to do what you want and not be noticed, then you don't go bringing it up, right? <laughs> if you want to do God's will, that's when you will know whether the teaching comes from God or from human authority. If you want to know what's right, if you want to be able to understand the Bible, it starts with the fear of the Lord, a desire to do what he wants. Another way of saying that, if you are not reading this book so as to learn how to do what God wants, you are not reading this book because that's what it's for and nothing else. It's true you can get history from it. It's true you can get philosophy from it. It's true there is narrative prose literature. That's true. There is genealogy. Yeah. There is poetry, of course. But it is not a history book. It is not a geography book. It is not a book of genealogy. It is not a book of the records of the kings of Israel. It is none of these things. It is the word of God. And its purpose is to teach us what we have to do to be right with him. And you don't understand it unless you're reading it to do what it says. That's what Jesus is saying. See, if you're reading this thinking, well, it's interesting or it's information. Well, then you read it and you, you don't see anywhere where it says thou shalt not. And you think that that means it's okay to do it. Why would you think that? Well, what if we were doing this a different way? What if you were trying to find out what does God want me to do? When you read the book and it tells you what to do, you do that. Guess what you don't do? Things that the book doesn't say, right? Because why would you do those things? You came here looking for answers, didn't you? You came, not, not here, but to the Bible. You went to the Bible looking for answers, didn't you? Well, take those answers. Don't supply your own, right? Why do we think that we have the key to salvation? Naaman, in ancient times, as recorded in 2 Kings 5, had a, an idea how he was going to be saved from leprosy. You know, I don't know, do, do you have a plan for how somebody is going to perform a miracle to, uh, you know, retrieve your life from a, from a terminal illness? <laughs> they're going to have this ceremony and they're going to stand here and they're going to wave the hand. And, and why would you think that? But we do. We always do. We think that we know how to be right with God. And that's unfortunate. We've got to humble ourselves, all of us, and listen to what the Bible really does say and do that. Now, having said all of this, that I think probably everybody agrees with, I want to make mention of the fact that I'm seeing in the churches uh, a serious, a very serious and a very alarming trend that people no longer believe that we can all understand the Bible alike. 
in the churches of Christ, they don't believe that anymore. And it's largely because of false teachers, uh, in some sense, have given everybody a, a pass and out to, well, you know, I may not have the same reading of that as he, but, you know, we're just trying to, to uh, uphold the weak. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, the passage that speaks of upholding the weak is, well, I'll challenge you to find it. I know where it is. Find it. See what it's talking about. It says something about mm, broken bones. How long do you leave bones broken and not set? Let me ask you that. And then you can go find that passage and see, does this mean that we just cover over problems and pretend they don't exist and allow them to continue uncorrected and unaddressed forever and ever and ever? No. There's nothing in Scripture that says any such thing. It's preposterous. Completely inconsistent with the nature of God. This Bible is the law of liberty. It is a mirror, says James 1. We look in the mirror so as to fix things, right? Hopefully you're not looking in the mirror to admire what you see there. I know that most of you can do that. I cannot do that. But the point of looking in the mirror is to see if anything's out of place. And if you do see something's out of place, you don't just walk away and say, huh, oh well, right? If the hat is crooked, well, you straighten it, right? The hair is out of place, you move it, you need a brush or whatever. You've got this morning's blueberry, it's right there on your, on your front tooth. Yeah, oh well, people are not gonna like that today. No, you take it off, right? You do something about it. That's what the book is for. Now, you're supposed to understand it is the thing. God gives us a word that we can understand alike. Of course he does. He's the powerful God of the universe. He created us. He created our minds. He created language. What kind of God couldn't get us a word that we could understand? No, the problem is not that it couldn't be understood. The problem is not that it's too complex. That's not true. None of that is true. The problem is the heart of man. People are not afraid of God. And people are not trying to do what he said. And that's the bottom line. But I'm afraid that, again, what I'm seeing in the churches is people just think you can't understand it alike. And you shouldn't draw lines of fellowship and you shouldn't be naming names, uh, identifying false teachers or any of the other things that the Bible tells you plainly that you're supposed to do. But people seem to not know that for some reason. Well, if you don't know that, you need to read some more, friends. And you need to go back to this book and understand that God speaks to you directly by means of his word. When you read it and you read it to listen, what does he want from us? It's confusing because when you look at the practices in the churches, you see all kinds of things that are not here and did not come from here. And there's no explanation for them. Why, why are you doing that? For me, it was uh, difficult. Uh, I obeyed the gospel uh, from, you know, I, I had been raised Catholic and I obeyed the gospel of, at age 16, I think, or 17, something like that. And, you know, this was all foreign to me. My expectations of what would be here and what actually are here are not the same. Um, and I'm realizing, you know, later in life that this confusion is coming from origins. You know, I really thought that everything here would be driven by what's in the Bible. And, you know, for the most part, you won't find a preacher that doesn't say that. You won't find a congregation that doesn't say that. What you'll find is preachers that don't do that and congregations that don't do that. They say that they do what the Bible says, but then, you know, well, you know, we've known this guy for many years and he's done so much good work. And so even though we know that he teaches error about divorce, we're still going to let him come and hold a gospel meeting here. Well, that's interesting. What verse of the Bible is that? Where in scripture did it say that God is pleased and served when we keep our old friends and our old ties and honor human beings over the truth of God in the pulpit. I didn't read that anywhere in the Bible. And neither did you, and neither did they. But they don't care what the Bible says. 
they care to say that they care what the Bible says because otherwise you can't be the preacher. You have to say that. But do you do it, Christian friend? That's the thing. What is the law to you? What is the rule to you? Who are you trying to please? God or man? I say this to you, brethren, and I speak kind of harshly about it because it's a matter of life and death. People are being slaughtered. The churches are just going down the tubes to this error that we cannot understand the Bible alike. And because they've swallowed that poison pill, that's why they're not willing to identify false teachers because they don't know who's a false teacher because they don't know what the Bible says and they don't think that you can know what the Bible says. And if you say that you do, like me, <laughs> then you are arrogant, you are proud, you are boastful, you know. And they'll reply with things like, well, I wouldn't be so proud. I wouldn't be so arrogant as to say that I understood anything in the scriptures. And, you know, my response to that is, well, then you should sit down and not teach. If you don't understand this book, stop teaching. Sit down and learn. Amen. That's how it should be. This book is understandable. Why would you think it's so hard to be saved? It's not hard on God's part. It's hard on our part. We have to be willing to do what he says. We have to be willing to listen to his word. And the trust is not in man. And it's not in dead people who wrote it down. It's in the God who inspired it. This word is powerful and it accomplishes what he sent it for. It doesn't return to an empty. And he wants to save us is the grand thing. The grandest thing about it is it's all about being saved. He wants us to go to heaven. And we can do so. We can be right with him. Today, if you're not a child of God yet, you're not a Christian, you need to obey the gospel for yourself. People say, am I ready to be baptized? That's the wrong question. The question is, do you need to be saved? Are you on your way to hell? Do you know where you're going and why? Do you need to be saved? If you do, obey God before it's too late. Let nothing stand in your way. But let us encourage you to do so. We have water here. We try to make it as easy as possible so that nothing is in your way should you decide that you are going to obey God in baptism for forgiveness of sins. We have water here prepared. Again, we have garments if you want to use them. Whatever it takes to make it as easy as possible. If today you're a Christian and haven't lived right, let us pray that you might be restored to him. None of us is above temptation either. When we say that we understand the Bible, we're not saying we have achieved sinless perfection. Nobody's saying that. We're saying that God is right and God gives us what we need. We'll help each other. But no, by no means have I uh, got a sinless perfection. Uh, you know, my children have seen my patience run out in recent days with uh, the move. And uh, I'm ashamed of that, but it, it does happen. Um, no, nobody's above these things. We need to pray for each other uh, in, in all times, especially in times of need. So by all means, let your need be known in the spirit. If today you need to obey the gospel, if you need the prayers of the saints, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.